technical difficulties. So plastics. Our favorite topic to love and hate <laughs> at the same time. Um, just love because it's good to know this information so that you can respond to people. Um, and this is a, um, I, I, this used to be a slide that everyone laughed at in my class and less and less people even see the reference, <laughs> but this is back in 1967, the movie, The Graduate, um, had um, a scene very early on where a gentleman took this young graduate, just graduated from college, aside and said, young man, the future is plastics. And just one word I have for you is plastics. And, um, you know, at that time, plastic seemed like it was going to change the world. It was going to be this amazing thing and this great opportunity. It did. They thought it was going to change maybe in a positive, more positive way. And, and, and then, <laughs> right. <laughs> Exactly. So, and then, you know, I mean, but the thing is that there, are, um, there were things they could do. You know, we used to carry our blood around in glass, which was precious cargo. And, and this is, and, you know, there were some things that they could, that it really was going to help um, a lot of surgery things that they can do with plastic. Um, but clearly, oh, my clicker is not making it go forward. Oh, come on. Click. There we go. Clearly, they got a little too excited. These are real commercials that they had. In oh my gosh. <laughs> this is cellophane, which isn't really plastic, but it still gets to go. <laughs> Clearly, not everything should be packaged, right? <laughs> and plastic does not need to be in all parts of our lives. Yeah, super sunshiny, happy. So, the goal of this presentation. Um, is going to be a couple of things. We're going to talk about why it's important to recycle right, especially when we're talking about plastics. Uh, we're going to talk about the complications about why it's so hard um, to recycle plastic and why some plastic just isn't going to be recyclable um, at, at a certain level. Um, and then we're going to put recycling in general, but recycling plastics specifically in context with how important is it to do recycling versus reduce, reuse, and why, well, you know, how, how, how much should we put all this energy into trying to recycle everything versus can we get the best we can and then start putting our energy into reduce and reuse kind of um, practices. So that is the goal, but I do want to re-emphasize and overemphasize because it, it often comes across that I think recycling is not useful. And um, re recycling is important. It is an important thing that we can do for our environment, for our trees, for our rivers, for our planet, for our health, um, and for our climate. Um, recycling will help. And it's really important that we recycle. We need to do it right so that it actually works. And we'll talk about why again, um, but it's, it's not gonna be enough. And so I don't want you to walk away feeling depressed, like, oh my gosh, I thought recycling was gonna be the answer. And um, now recycling is not good at all. Recycling is important. It's just not good enough to, we need to do more is really what I'm trying to get at with this. <coughs> so I wanna remember that recycling is about um, interrupting the need to go back out into the world and extract materials for the, um, from our rivers, from our earth, from you know the the oil and and um, ga natural gas that it takes to make plastic is stripping our planet of those things. Um, and it, that recycling also is about not get, having to get all the materials from metal or paper, glass. And, and that's the most valuable thing about recycling is it makes it so that we, um, this cycle here, and I can come over here if I can get around. So this is talking about the different part stages of a, of a product or a, um, a, a piece of material. And they, the idea is that raw materials come in, so we cut down a tree for glass or for paper, or we go and extract oil or natural um, gas, uh, gas from the earth and then we put it into production and we make the product and then we use it and then we we get rid of it and every stage along this cycle has a cost 
There's pollution involved with each one of these. It takes energy. We often use water to manufacture things, to use things. We use a lot of energy sometimes. Um, and to discard things, we've seen it. You've been there. It takes a lot of energy to, to go through and use the machinery to sort it and then melt it down and turn it back into something else. So these are all the um, stages of the things that we have. And, you know, in the old days, it was always just one line. It was kind of a single line and we would just go use it or make it, use it, and then throw it away. And we are trying to get back to not doing the disposal as much as we did in the 80s and 90s. When I say old days, that was kind of the direction we were going is just straight to disposal and waste. Now we're trying to recapture this stuff and put it back into production, right? And that's the magic. That's what makes recycling most important is if we can capture it and put it back into the cycle and interrupt that need to get natural resources. Okay, so plastic is especially hard to do that with because, well, for many reasons. When you think about it, um, what, what is it when somebody decides to go into the business to be a recycler, what is their bottom line? What are they trying to do? What is their job? What is their role in the world? <laughs> what is their business model? What do you think? To be efficient, to be effective, to lower our carbon footprint. Yeah. So some of them want to lower our carbon footprint, but I mean, their bottom line is that they need to make money, mm -hmm. right? That, that that's what the if they're going into corporate America to be a recycler, they they need to make money to be able to keep doing it, and so that means that they they are they do want to be super efficient, like you were talking about, in order to compete with other businesses out there. And when you think about it, the the businesses that have been manufacturing these products and sending them to us have been in the business of doing this for a very long time. There's a huge funnel headed right at us as consumers um, to, to getting that material you know, to us from virgin to you know, stripping it and manufacturing and getting it to us because that's what they want us to do. And so the uh, recycling companies have to kind of interrupt that and, and do it in a way that costs less than this huge funnel. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately it does not cost less to recycle. So that is a real challenge for them right in the beginning. Um, and then, so the, then there's other big challenges when it comes to plastic. So that's just re recycling. That's a challenge that all of them have. But plastic especially is challenging because the, the, the raw material is petroleum and natural gas. And those are huge, huge corporations that have lots of money and are very low cost most of the time. Right now we're, you know, right now the price is quite high. So it might be that recycling is probably doing a little better right now. Um, so when, when, when the gas prices go up, recycling gets better. When prices go down, the you know, <laughs> it's for, for plastics. So it's all about markets really. Um, but it's also other things that make it complicated. So most of the time with just paper, office paper, paper is paper, it's made from trees, it's kind of the same material. Plastic has been made from several different kinds of uh, base um, material, um, chemicals. And so think about these two products here and what they're useful for. When you think about a milk jug, it, it, you want it to be something that, that's thick enough to keep your milk warm, right? I mean, cold <laughs> and um, durable so that if you accidentally drop it when you're coming from the grocery store, it won't split. Um, it's not so important that you can see the milk. Um, so those are some of the things that they need that plastic to be like. It's durable, thick to protect the milk um, and not so important to be clear. But the wine glass, you know, oftentimes at wine events, they want you to see the beautiful colors of the wine. Um, and so it needs to be clear. So they, they are expecting different things from all of these plastics. And so that's why they've created so many different kinds of plastics out there is to, to make it so that they can do different things for us. But it turns out that these two things, if you tried to melt them together, you'd have a brittle because this is a the wine glass, you think about how brittle it is. It's really hard and it easily cracks. 
if you put milk in it, it would, you know, you might lose your milk. <laughs> so, you know, it's not, it, it, trying to melt it together is one problem and one reason why they can't be mixed together. Another reason they can't be mixed together, and I have some examples of this that you can look at, is that when the way that they make plastic is um, by, they take these, um, big huge vats and they melt the plastic into the vats mm -hmm. and it comes all the way down and then and then you can see these little dots right here mm -hmm. that's what makes the pellets these are all the little pellets and something cuts it off so it's melting and then they put it into these pellets yeah. And then they sell these pellets to another company that will make it into a form, into a shape. And it turns out that when they melt these plastics, they can't be melted at the same temperature. So a number six plastic, polystyrene, melts much more quickly than a number two plastic, HDPE. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you tried to put them together in a vat, one of them might turn into gas before you've even been able to melt it, or one of them might not melt fast enough and it gums up the holes and then they can't get them down in together. Mm -hmm. So they can't just be mixed because they, they act differently together when they're, when they're being melted. Um, so another reason that it's complicated. So this is remelted, re not the first melt. This, so that is how they make it from raw materials. Okay. And so in order to in, be just like, because they basically need to make the same product as the manufacturers want, or the manufacturers are going to go, I have to change my machinery to deal. So they want to make beads just like the manufacturers expect. So they want the beads to look exactly like the manufacturers want. So they need to use the same machine yeah. that the virgin yeah. material folks use. Yeah, I'm sorry. Please ask because it's kind of complicated what I'm trying to explain and I have it in my head. So if it doesn't, if it doesn't translate, let me know. <laughs> yeah, so this is how they do it with virgin. It's also how they do it with, with recycled. Yeah, and I'm using the word virgin. It's a common thing that they say in recycling and that means when they use raw materials to make it, they call it virgin versus recycled materials. Okay, so that is another reason why it gets really complicated when we're recycling plastic. How's, how's everyone going? Mm -hmm. Making some sense, catching some of it. So another problem with plastics is as you know, us consumers get to mix all of our plastics and in with paper and metal all in the same container. And you've seen them try to sort that stuff out at the, at the material recovery facility. It's, um, it used to be a lot easier when customers were like, oh, this is this, and I'll put it in this container, or this is this, especially when it's just glass and metal and paper. Um, but now it's all mixed together and they have to sort it out. And as you saw, it was even just hard for them to sort paper from plastic, from metal, much less number six plastic, number five plastic, number one plastic, number two. Um, so there's a number of different ways that they um, can sort all this mixed up plastic so that they can send the number six plastic to the manufacturers who want number six and number two plastic to the manufacturers that need number two. Um, so how do they separate those resins so that they can make sure that they get to the manufacturers? These are pictures of master recyclers separating plastic at uh, plastics recycling events. Um, it's complicated and it, it, you know, everyone's looking at the bottom of the containers and they're feeling it. And, you know, you've seen the massive volumes now um, when we're at the material recovery facility, you've seen how much it is. There's nobody looking underneath each container and trying to figure out what to do. It's just too crazy in there for them to do that. So before I get into how they do mix it, if, if these numbers aren't useful at the bottom, where did they come from in the first place? Why do we have them? I'm going to go through a little side, <laughs> side conversation on that. So these numbers were not invented by the recycling industry. They were invented in 1988 um, by the 
people who make plastic from raw material, from virgin material. And they were feeling the pressure in the 80s. That was the time when um, plastic was um, starting to show up a lot and people were starting to be concerned. Well, well, this is starting to show up in our streets and our landfills and our rivers. And shouldn't we be concerned about this? And the company's like, well, we'll just put these recycle symbols on there and then maybe people will feel less concerned about it. And they still to this day say on their website that the chasing arrows does not imply recyclability. They do not want us to believe that those chasing arrows are recyclable about recycling, but that's what everybody thinks it is. And they, that is what they want us to think. <laughs> so, and then they say, well, it's solely to identify the plastic resin. That's why we put it on there. But nobody who needs to know what the plastic resin is looking at the bottom of the containers, except for these really small gatherings that we have where we're collecting plastic. So really those numbers are only useful for making consumers feel less bad about their, their packaging. <laughs> yeah. So going back to the original question, how do they support, how do they separate resins? We can't have resins mixed together, right? So how do we separate them? So there's a number of different ways that they separate resins in the industry. One of them is what they call a melting and burning property. And this is really useful if you maybe uh, work in an industry where there's a lot of the same plastic showing up. So I'll give you an example. We had a master recycler who worked at the zoo and the bear's food would come in these giant barrels. And they, they were huge barrels with bear food in it. And they would take the food out and they'd end up with all these big giant plastic barrels and they didn't know what kind of plastic it was. So they called a local plastics recycler and asked them, can you take these? And he said, well, let me come over. And he chipped off a piece of the plastic and he melted it. And he saw the color of the smoke when it melted off. And he said, oh, HDP, HDPE, number two plastic, I'd be happy to take it. And so now all the, the bare food is, um, barrels are going to this local recycler in Woodburn. Um, so that is one way that you can do it, but it only works if you have a large volume of material, you know, in order, because if you're trying to do a whole bunch of little containers, they're not going to do that for every single little container. But it works for like big, like for businesses, like, like, or like the Zoom. Now, the technique that they used to always use in the United States to separate plastic is what they call the sink and float technique. And this technique, I have a little example. It turns out that if you use plastics that are only bottles um, and you chip them up and you put them in a big giant vat of water, then the ones that float happen to be compatible with each other. They can be melted and, and turned into plastic wow. together. And the ones that sink can be scraped off the bottom and they can be recycled together. And so they use, they, especially in California, um, they, this is the technique that they use for sorting plastic um, for ages. And that was the reason why until 2008, we only accepted plastic bottles because we were trying to get all of our recycling to work for this California company who was recycling it. Um, and so they were able to put it into a big giant vat and, um, and sort it out and get it recycled. <laughs> so that worked really well, um, but it um, turns out we started getting more and more plastics um, as well. And then we started learning that in Asia, they have a lot more technology um, that's more sophisticated. And in our region, the only place that uses this technology is the facility that you visited. <laughs> um, but most people are not able to use, um, oh, well, manual labor. All of us have saw that, but it can't go to much as level, but they can go to much more deep level um, in Asia because it's, it's less expensive labor there. Um, but they also used more technology to do laser and magnetic technology. So it turned out that they could add tubs to the list. And since we knew most of our recycling was starting to go to Asia anyways, we said, okay, let's go ahead and add tubs to the yes list. Um, because 
the, the technology can sort bottles and tubs from each other. So you might be thinking that's awfully strange that the shape, whether it be a bottle or a tub, makes a difference for the sink float method. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about this shape thing. We talked about shape um, in the class earlier because you, you saw that most of our system is set up to separate paper, which is flat, from the containers, which is a shape, right? We, we talk about not smashing anymore so that they can go, oh, a container goes this direction and paper goes this. But shape is important for another reason too, and it's in plastic. And that's because the way that we form the plastic after they take these pellets <laughs> and put them into a mold and it changes the plastic. And some of them are easier and some of them are harder to recycle after they've been melted into the forms. So these two are the forms that are easiest to, um, to recycle. The one on the left is how they make bottles. And basically what they do is they make a, a basic shape and then they clamp onto it and then they put really hot air into the shape and it blows into the mold. So they call it a blow mold um, and that makes a bottle. And that's what that is, is it's blown into that mold on the left. Now the right is not a tub. I, I was trying to find a good picture of a mold, um, a uh, injection mold fr frame for a tub. And I, this is a helmet, um, but it's still the same concept where basically they, they pour the plastic into one part of the mold and then close the mold into it. And that makes the tub. And so this is how they make the two kinds of plastic that are most recyclable. Um, but they now have a new kind that they've been creating that really makes it super thin and really easy, lightweight um, and easy, easy material to, to make. And they use this thing called a Theraform where they make kind of a big sheet of plastic. And then it goes through the machine, the yellow part of the, the machine is going through and it blows both sides into the form. And that is how they're making the clam shells and the coffee, the, the drink cups and the, the um, sort of crinkly kind of flower pots. Um, and it turns out that the melting process that they use to make this changes the structure of the plastic. And I have not read anything that explains to me why or how very well, but I'm not a scientist. So maybe it's just, <laughs> maybe I just didn't understand this stuff, but it just, I trust that that I um, you know what they're saying is that that going through this process changes the plastic, mm -hmm. and it makes it one not compatible with the other two, but two just much less recyclable. Sure. Yeah, so the shape really does affect whether we can recycle it or not. So plastic is complicated. Mm -hmm. It's a lot more difficult and complicated and takes a lot more resources. It's a lot more expensive. Um, and it's gonna take a lot more technology if we wanna try to figure out how to recycle it. So who am I doing on top? Oh, I see this three. So again, the forms can affect whether they're compatible with each other. It can affect whether we can sort them from each other and it affects whether they're recyclable or not. So yeah, it's, and, and think of the millions of shapes and sizes and, of plastic that they've done. So it makes it really complicated. Especially because people are trained now to smash the milk curtains. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. I just had my family take them out and they all just, yay! <laughs> it's kind them. of satisfying when you smash yeah. them. <laughs> Sometimes the family is disappointed they don't get to do that. Mm -hmm. So then to add to it, the complication, not only does the, those, what I've been talking about is when you just use the pure form of a plastic. So this is, you know, my glasses on, but it was a certain kind of plastic. It was like maybe number five. So um, it turns out also that they put a lot of additives into plastic. So sometimes you'll notice that your tub says number four and the lid says number four. The lid's not allowed, the, the tub is. Now we know the shape, is part of the reason, but it's also, you notice that the tub is rigid and the lid is pliable. That's strange if they're the same resin, they should act differently from each or the same as each other, but they've added something to the lid to make it so it's soft and pliable. 
and that changes whether it can be mixed in with everything. Same with, remember I told you on the first night that plastic bags you can bring to the grocery store and any kind of plastic that you can easily stretch and poke a hole through, you can put into the grocery store plastic bags. But this one is loud and crinkly and you can't easily stretch and poke a hole. They're the same plastic, but this one, they put extra chemicals in to make it so that it'll preserve your your um, pretzels. You want preserved pretzels, so it's okay that they do that. You don't necessarily want your pretzels to go bad, but it does make it so we have to throw this away. So it gets complicated. Um, and on top of that, they keep coming up with new fangled ideas. This is made from corn. And this is made from plastic. It's a tub. So the public thinks they're the same thing and will put them in. And this does not do this a favor at all. You do not want to mix them at all. Um, so that is a big problem that, that they're always changing things. And so it's really hard. Unfortunately, it does say, please compost me on the bottom. Um, you don't know, you can't, as a consumer, you cannot know, although you can see they act differently over time, but when you just ate from it, you would, the reason I knew is I threw mine in the dishwasher and it turned into a little flat disc. <laughs> and so this one stayed shaped. So we're like, oh, what was wrong with this? So yeah, you can, you can cast it around and feel those. Yeah. So why aren't you using more corn? Corn is a most petroleum intensive crop out there. It is not a really, not going to save the planet to try to use corn. Right, right, right. Yeah. Oh so, yeah, it's not. What is it petroleum intensive? It takes a lot of fertilizer, a lot of, you know, manufacturing and a lot of, you know, the tractors. It's not good for our earth. And a lot of pesticides. Right? Pesticides. But corn is in everything. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Food is a whole other conversation. <laughs> yeah, it's for sure. Yeah, and then they have it so much, and and then they they have so much of it that they're trying to make packaging out of it even too, and it's not actually more environmentally friendly. Yeah, so as as they told the masa, or no masa, maíz, maíz, así la palabra. No, no se puede. Pero parece igual como eso. Ya que sí se puede. Sí. Ajá. Es muy difícil. No, tampoco. Yeah, so she said, well, couldn't you put it in the compost because it's made from corn, but unfortunately, it's not useful for the compost either. And so, um, yeah, it's just what they call greenwashing. Yeah, that's a really good question. <laughs> I'm still upset about the triangle thing. Come on. We don't know what that means. All right, so it's a conspiracy. <laughs> okay, I might have some of those values that I'm sharing with you. So, okay, so let's return back to, to why is it important? We've been, why, recycling is good. It's gonna interrupt things. Um, this is why it's so important to recycle right. We've been talking a lot about recycling more in our country. But it's really complicated to try to recycle everything. And right now, we're not doing a very good job of recycling the things that are easy to recycle. We're putting a lot of junk in the recycling that doesn't belong there. And so we started a new campaign in the metro area called Recycle or Not. And, and it's in Spanish, too, Reciclar or No. And it's really a really great website that, like, if somebody has something in their hand and it says, and you're not sure what to do with it, it says, yes, put it in the recycling, no, put it in the garbage. And, and people push back like crazy on this and want us to say, oh, bring it somewhere. But we're just trying to help people understand that it's better put it in the garbage than try to make the recycling do something with it. And if you're not gonna take it somewhere else, you're not gonna carry it somewhere and get it recycled, it's better to put it in the garbage than to try to put it in the recycling when it doesn't belong in the recycling. So that is why this campaign is really focused on yes, no. 
and and just put it in the garbage if you <laughs> and when in doubt put it in the garbage it's better to do that obviously there are some places you can take some um plastics um, but this campaign is really focusing on making sure everyone understands what does go in the recycling and what does not go in the recycling uh, no no se puede no <laughs> eso es, es hecho de un um, Un forma que no se puede reciclar. Tampoco es. Yeah, so she was saying, so what about that cup that's up on the picture? That's recyclable. And I said, nope, that's, that's not part of it. Yeah. This is the only, I was starting to say this and I realized I didn't finish it last week. If you memorize these four shapes, then you have the list of what's allowed and you don't have to keep trying to think, is this recyclable? Is this recyclable if it's plastic? It's four sizes and shapes and they are size and shape. Ooh, there should be two, size and shape. There we go. <laughs> and so it's bottles with the neck that are six ounces or larger. Yogurt like tops tubs so they need to be rigid uh, rigid and like the lid can come off you know it's not attached in any way is how you might describe those tubs because tub we've turned out can be complicated like like trish pulled out those black trays that kind of look like tubs and they like some people are like is that a tub or is not so uh, it needs to be kind of round and rigid um like like a yogurt or you know or like a butter container and then flower pots that are four inches or larger and buckets that are five gallons or smaller. That's it, just those four things. And that gets us a lot of plastic. We will be able to recycle those things and turn them into new things and stop getting old, you know, virgin material when we use these things, if they're clean. <laughs> yeah, so it's really important that we keep them clean. How clean do you have to get the, uh, the soap? Yeah, so uh, when I mean plastics. clean, I mean don't try to put something that doesn't belong in there. Rinse them out a little bit. Yeah, just rinse them out. They don't, I used to put them in the dishwasher and I'm realizing that it's really, it's okay to just rinse them out. The, the cleaning is actually more important just so that like stuff doesn't dribble out onto paper, you know, that it's in your recycling. Um, so you, you wouldn't want liquids enough that might drip out onto your onto your um, paper. So when it's done, it's done. It's, yeah. Yeah. Somebody said more spatula clean. Yeah, like, that's you know, good. Like, like, yeah. I, I give it a good rinse. Yeah. yeah. I think rinse is the word we use in almost all our literature. And I think that's right. Just mm -hmm. a quick rinse. Just a little water you know, and then you're done with it. Especially like if it's oily, don't worry. <laughs> you know, there's a little slippery oily on that. That's okay. So there are, like I said, there are some places you can take plastics. There's two local companies that are doing a lot of recycling um, locally. Um, Denton Plastic uh, is one of the companies that's taking some of the barrels that I was talking about from the zoo, um, but they are also the company that's um, taking almost all our plastic from our bottle bill plastic because it's a nice clean uh, stream. When you give them bottles, it's just bottles, so they can sort it the way we used to do. Um, and so he can get the number one, which is his favorite plastic, and the number five, and then he sells the others to other places. Um, on the right is Agilix, and they take number six plastic, and they're more complicated. So they take styrofoam, so people love them, um, but they're more complicated. What they're doing is they're actually breaking the plastic back down to the chemical base, and wow. um, so it is back to liquid. So now that would be ideal if they use that liquid to make plastic again that you know, any number six, because it wouldn't matter how it was formed anymore, right? All that mm -hmm. stuff I talked about forming would be gone out of the equation. Um, but the problem is that there's a lot of research that's showing that a lot of this plastic is being sent to Mississippi to be used uh, for burning, um, for, for fueling the, manuf um, the, the, um, the manufacturing there. And I have a video that I'm gonna show at the end that shows the, the effects on people's lives in Mississippi oh. from that. So not all of it is going there, but it is definitely questionable. There's definitely some research that's showing that they are trying to find markets to recycle it, but there's not enough transparency about where it's really going. 
Um, and so that's something that our new laws in Oregon are gonna do is add more transparency about where recycling is going. And hopefully we can get that because it's a good idea that they have, but they're just struggling with enough money, enough, you know, enough to make capital, enough to sell um, by just using it for plastics recycling. Um, and so they're finding selling it as fuel sometimes is, is more productive for them. And our state laws will help pay for them to incentivize them to use it for plastics again. Yeah. So the other thing, here's where I start making the case where we need to think upstream. What a lot of the problems with plastic and when I mean upstream, I mean before the consumer got it. Um, they, a lot of the problems with plastic, um, don't recycling isn't going to solve. When you think about it, plastic has a lot of toxins in it that when babies chew in it or when we eat, we learned about this last week, um, it's toxic already. So using that is... Um, Recycling it isn't going to avoid kids having access to that, right? Um, also, um, this picture of the octopus is art that's at the zoo right now uh, that was made by an artist that used found plastic from the ocean. Um, it's beautiful art. Um, but, it, you know, plastics in the ocean, um, and I'm going to go into some really good research that shows that recycling is not going to solve that problem either. Um, and then finally, also, I'm going to talk about how recycling is only going to do a very little bit to help us. Recycling plastic is only going to do a little bit to help us with climate change. It will help, but not enough. So let's go down this and talk about a little bit more. So there's been some, everyone's really worried about the amount of plastic that's in the ocean. And we should be. There's, it's crazy how much plastic is in the ocean. So there's been some really good new research about where is it, where is it, what plastic is in the ocean, and then how is it getting into the ocean? How is it getting in there so that we can stop it, rather than thinking we know where, where it's coming from? And there's three major ways it's getting in, um, and one of them, a big, big, as much as a third of the plastic in the ocean is coming from fishing practices. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, us worrying about our single use plastic in our kitchen is not going to change that. We're gonna to have to make some decisions about who we buy our fish from mm -hmm. um, so that we know that they're making good decisions about how they, how they fish. Um, so another one, and they don't have very good solutions for this one yet, is microbeads. Um, how many of you heard of microbeads? Have you heard of them before a little bit in the news or no? Oh, ouch. <laughs> Yank our earring. Um, so microbeads, they're finding out that there's plastic is breaking down into itty bitty little microscopic, microscopic levels. And it's all over in the ocean. It's everywhere. It's in, our blood. it's in our blood. It's in our bodies. And they did a recent study in Oregon um, last, a year and a half ago where they tested 100 different sites of mussels. In 100% of those um, tests, they found microbeads in the ocean mussels. So it's everywhere. And it's right here in our home in, our, in Oregon. Um, so th they believe that much of that's coming from clothes. Um, it can also be coming from all sorts of different um, products that we buy that have the microbeads in them, like sometimes toothpaste, sometimes so the makeup and then lotions. There can be all sorts of different things that, that is in, but clothes is a big one. Um, so they're trying to think about different ways that we can wash that will maybe capture the clothes better, uh, the, the microbeads when, when we're washing our clothes. Um, so there's a lot to understand with microbeads and I don't feel like they, I haven't seen enough evidence that, that we know what to do about it for me to give you some suggestions about what we can do. But let's get into the single use plastic. It is a major way that plastic is getting in the oceans. And it turns out it's tricky how it's getting into the ocean. Um, and we need to understand it in order to be able to solve it. Um, the research is showing, and I actually really don't like the way that they've 
word the, the research, but I'll describe it first and then describe my problems with it. <laughs> but they, um, they describe that they have found that um, the, pretty much Europe and the United States are the ones who produce single use plastic the most. Not a big surprise. We all consume a lot of things that are forks and silverware and spoons and cups and, you know, and so we are producing it all. But we have really good landfills. And so if it gets in our landfill in the United States, it stays there forever. So it's not getting into the ocean here. So where, how is it getting into the ocean? So their research is saying, well, it turns out that they actually looked at where plastic is and where is it getting in. And it's from countries that don't have landfills that are closed that they're wide open and they're sitting on waterways like we were until the 1990s. We just, 1990, our landfill looked just like that here in Portland area, mm -hmm. but now we've closed it up. And, but they haven't in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. So the researchers say, well, it's their fault then because they're mismanaging the, the, their landfills. But I wanna ask you to think about that. If they're not the ones generating it because the research says we generate it, we're the number one generator and they're the ones that are getting it in the ocean. If we're generating it, how are they getting it and then putting it in the ocean? When we put it in the recycling. Yeah, and we're not recycling correct. So they have to throw it somewhere because they can't pay somebody to take it from them. They have no more room. And so they put it in their landfill. So the most effective way that we can put plastic in the ocean is by putting the wrong thing in our recycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you were going to ask something. Yeah, I, I heard years ago that in New York, and, you know, the Upper East Coast, it was so congested that they had like big barges of trash that they would send out in the ocean and that they would just dump it in the mm -hmm. ocean. Yeah. Is that true? Mm -hmm. They're not allowed to do that. So in the 90s, there was definitely a garbage barge that was going up and down and up and down, and they were trying to figure out what to do with it. Because it didn't have a place to go. It right? didn't have a place to go. Yeah. They, but, you know, and then I did recently hear that there was a recycle barge in, uh, in New York, actually, maybe a year or two ago, that they were doing the same thing. And I was like, oh, here we are, <laughs> the same problem. We're just calling it recycling instead of garbage now. <laughs> And I don't know what I heard, but I, you know, if we in the United States have very strict laws about what we're allowed to do with it, they probably sold it to some poor country that doesn't have, that has a landfill like that one. Um, they probably did finally find someone. But the reason that happened, actually, Trish, and we're going to use perfect timing for your question is, is this slide. So I, I mentioned that we keep sending stuff that they cannot recycle to especially China was taking most of our recycling. Um, and they'd have to put it in their landfill or they would burn it. Um, and it was polluting their environment. And so for environmental reasons, they told the United States and Europe, we're not taking your recycling anymore. No more for environmental reasons. You would think that we would open our eyes and realize maybe we should rethink how we're doing recycling it for environmental reasons. They said, we won't take it anymore. But instead we said, oh, we'll send, send it to India instead. And to, to uh, you know, we're, we keep just trying to find the other people that will take all our plastic because we really, really want to recycle. <laughs> and so we keep trying to find other places to send it. Um, so um, they can recycle the things that I mentioned that, that we can recycle, but it, we send so much stuff they can't recycle. So we're just sending their garbage. So, sorry, did you need to ask a question? No. So let's get to climate change. I was talking about oceans and the plastic. Um, we have some really amazing research in that, um, that we are super lucky here in Oregon because we have a person who is um, known across the country and actually been known in Europe as well um, for really questioning what we know about climate change and how it relates to materials that we consume. And he's done some really good research here in Oregon and has figured out that most of our climate emissions come from electricity and fuels, 
from services and from materials you can see on this bar. And then he said, if we were able to recycle 100% of all the stuff, all the packaging and all the single use plastic and paper metal plastic, if we could recycle it all, got what he calls nirvana of zero waste, then you can see the little tiny hash, mac, hash marks on the top um, that we would get about 3% of our climate emissions would be lowered. So it, it's good because not very many things can get 3% of our climate emissions lowered, but you can see the rest of the bar is still there. <laughs> so we have so much more that we need to get done. So I'm running out of time. So I'm gonna sh skip this video and show his. Um, I don't know if I believe that though, because when we went through COVID and we were all in lockdown, I think we saw tremendous changes in our environment. Yeah. Where, uh -huh. You know, they could show satellite pictures of, yeah. of places that they hadn't been able to see yes. for, for generations. And, and that's exactly, let me go back and show that that actually really makes his point because the materials, electricity and services all went down. We stopped consuming all those stuff. It wasn't because we were recycling. It was, we stopped yeah, we doing stopped the emissions. Yeah, we stopped, we stopped yeah. making we stopped stuff. We stopped using yeah. stuff. Yeah. 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 We stopped driving to work. We stopped. Yeah. So actually, you, what you just said is exactly what he said, you know, like an experience. You had the experience of what his science was trying to tell us. And it, so, yes, the fact is, but what, that little sliver on the top is just recycling. It, what you saw was the effects of us stopping consuming. Uh, yeah. So shouldn't that be inverted? I mean, if recycling is just this much, then, I mean, we need to focus on all of it, but mm -hmm. why aren't we focusing on more of the, the other pieces there? I mean, yes! <laughs> I mean, we're gonna die if we don't. No, focus. we don't. Exactly. We need to focus on, you just said exactly everything. It's exactly right that we need to do it all. We need to recycle, but only the stuff that we are already doing a pretty good job of recycling, get it better, you know, get it cleaner. And then let's focus on other stuff. And he has some ideas in this video about how we can do that. And then also I have a couple of things in my last slide. Uh, if I can figure out how to get it forward again. All right. The steady drumbeat of oops, I stopped it. Of recycle, recycle, recycle has created a culture um, that's really sucked a lot of the oxygen out of the room. There are very real benefits to recycling, but sometimes those benefits have been overhyped. To avoid the worst effects of climate change, and by this I mean the potential extinction of half of all species on the planet, the deaths of a million people or more, the permanent displacement of tens of millions of people from their homes. In order to avoid those kinds of consequences, we need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions in this country by around 90%. Total recycling and composting will reduce emissions by 3%. So as a climate change strategy, recycling is helpful, and it is entirely insufficient. It gets us nowhere close to the reduction of impacts that we need. So the approach we've taken here in Oregon is a very holistic approach and a very science-based approach. It counts up the environmental impacts across all the stages of that life cycle, and then identifies where in the life cycle can we act to achieve the greatest benefits for the environment. You go to the store, you buy something, you bring it home. All of the activities that were necessary to produce that material, to package it, to produce the packaging, the supply chain, transporting it to the retailer. All of those activities we call upstream. They occur prior to you using it. And then when you no longer want the material and you discard it, it either goes to recycling or it goes to composting. Maybe it goes to a landfill or a waste incinerator. Those impacts are downstream. Here in Oregon, 99% of the greenhouse gas emissions occur upstream of the consumer and only 1% occurs downstream. Let's say you're standing in the grocery store and you're buying some instant coffee 
And the coffee is packaged in a couple different formats. There's this thing here, which is a plastic tub. In many communities in the United States, this plastic container could be placed in your recycling container. Alternatively, you could buy your coffee in a steel container. This steel container is really easy to recycle. And then there's this newfangled package over here, some kind of metal plastic laminate. And there's no program anywhere in the country that wants this in the recycling container. This has to go in the garbage can. And you might say to yourself, oh, I don't want to buy this because it's going to make garbage. But when we go out and we quantify how much energy is required to produce each of these different formats, how much pollution results from producing these materials, that this thin, flexible material ends up being the best environmental choice so long as it goes in the landfill. A lot of consumers are making their choices based on whether or not something is easy to recycle, and that is not a meaningful predictor of environmental impact. It's pretty random. It's about as useful as tossing a coin or consulting a Ouija board. Recycling is a very visible way of demonstrating that we're responsible people and we're trying to do good for the environment. Don't get me wrong, we, we need more recycling and we need better recycling. It's just that recycling by itself is an insufficient solution. Lots of people know that mantra, reduce, reuse, recycle, but what some people forget is that that's a ranked priority of solutions. We should reduce and reuse first because environmentally, they deliver a much greater bang for the buck. There's a lot we can do as individuals to use materials more responsibly, from the food that we choose to purchase and eat, the houses or the housing that we live in, the stuff that we buy or that we don't buy. In a democratic country such as our own, individuals can flex not only their consumer muscle, they can flex their muscles as citizens and advocates as well. They can communicate to the companies they buy from, that they expect them to reduce the environmental impacts of materials, and they can work through the political process to drive at the sorts of collective changes that are needed to reduce the environmental impacts of materials. All right, so let's see if I can get this to stop, please. Look. The steady. So there's a few things that we've done in our, our local governments to start doing exactly what you talked about, Trish, and burning that thing so we stop focusing on that little tiny scrape at the top and we start really looking at the bigger picture. So some of them have been like tackling this, all this single use plastic and trying to change some laws like the plastic bags. Um, we also have some uh, laws like in Portland, they have to ask you if you want a spoon and, and fork and everything with your package um, when, when you go into fast food or any kind of restaurant. Um, so that's some ways that we are working on like trying to stop that single use plastic. But on a much larger scale, um, we, are the, we, we are the first of, there's three states in the United States now that have passed what we've already talked about, the producer responsibility laws, where we start asking the producers of all this stuff to help pay for the solution. And that'll make it so one, they start thinking about design, they stop trying to like force stuff down our throat. Um, and they help us, they're actually going to pay a big chunk of money for us to be more creative in doing reduce and reuse kind of campaigns and programs in our state. Um, so the recycling folks and the, and the, the producers are going to help us stop using their products, <laughs> which is pretty cool. Um, and they're now working on a national uh, law um, that, that would be similar. So they're Colorado and us and um, Oregon and Maine are the three states that Colorado just passed one. Hi there. So I'm just finishing. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so I just have this one last slide. Hi. And then I do want to open up for questions. We started a little late, so I'm quite on time, but we can just, yeah. So, so there's a lot of stuff we do have the power to do at home, too. Um, and next, next couple of weeks, we're really going to focus on that. Um, we do have a homework assignment for next week, and that is to bring an item like a, a, a small appliance um, that, that is broken. 
So if you have a lamp, um, a um, blender, uh, any kind of um, you know small, pretty much if you can plug it in and carry it here, then <laughs> then then bring it in here. So, entienden tenemos tarea para la la semana próxima, and so we have two volunteers that are fixers, and they're going to come in and help us try to fix the things. Do you understand that, Masaru? So we're going to bring. Do that again. So next week we have homework. Uh -huh. We're going to bring a broken um appliance so appliance. maybe yeah so maybe a small blender or a lamp anything that you can plug in a wall electrical item that isn't working yeah and so they're going to try to help us fix it so that is that is our homework for next week um and the reason that we're doing that is because there's a whole movement in our region called the repair fairs and we and uh, clackamas county has actually planned one every month for the whole summer and master recyclers are involved with them where you can go to these repair fairs and you don't have to be a fixer to help you can just help greet people and check them in and things like that but a lot of master recyclers have actually become apprentices of the fixers and learned how to fix that counts as master cycler hours. So I don't know if Trevor or Ayla might be interested in oh, something like that. Lost it's lost art. It's yeah. a lost art to, to repair it. Sorry, I just called him Trevor. Yeah. <laughs> Trevor. That's so funny. I just called my boss Gustav, and his name is Stefan. <laughs> like, He's ready to. I just <laughs> I don't remember names at all. So, yes, so we can do stuff. So we're going to take a, a break, but I want to see if people have, I just said a lot. And luckily you guys ask questions is what I want. But do you have questions or thoughts that you want to go over before we take our break? Tienen preguntas? Yo sé que es mucho. Okay, well, let's take a 10 minute break. We'll get back together. It's 10 now. So, so 720. Get up, move around, descanso. I just feel like it's coming down. It is. Oh, so it's on the corner. Oh, it's a tree. Yeah. 